What's up guys? Hope you're having a good day. Welcome to the UFC 259 breakdown video where we're going to be taking a deep dive into all of the main card fights taking place this weekend at UFC 259 from a betting perspective. Hopefully you'll be able to use the information in this video to make better betting decisions and we're going to be going so deep on these main card fights guys. These fights are could be potentially great for betting so i hope all the stuff that i'm going to talk about right now is really going to help you so get comfortable chill out for the next hour and don't forget to leave a comment below and let me know what you think about anything that i've said in this video but please before you do leave a comment remember everything that i say in this video is backed up by hours and hours and hours of extensive research if you'd also like to watch breakdown videos for all of the fights that I won't have time to cover in this video, check out my website, MMABettingTips.com. On there, you'll find a 10-minute breakdown video, 5 to 10-minute breakdown video of all the prelim fights on this card as well. And you will also see archived videos of all my fight research. So you'll get about, you know, 15 to 30 hours of video content on the site for every UFC event. And don't forget... There are still a few spaces left available in my live betting group, which won't last so much longer. The live betting group is going to be closed down soon. So if you've been interested in my live betting tips, you know, if you've been thinking about joining, you need to do it quick because those opportunities won't be there for much longer. If you would like to take a look at our results, how we've been doing, I've been posting some recent videos over the last few weeks on my YouTube channel. Go check them out. I strongly recommend you take a look. And also, it's that stage in the YouTube video where we do a little bit of a business deal. If you would like me to do a prop bet live stream this weekend for UFC 259, where we dig through all of the fights taking place this weekend and try and find a decent value prop bet, don't forget, hit the like button below. If this video gets 300 likes... 300 likes, that's all I'm asking, 300 likes, we will do a prop bet live stream on Saturday. If you don't know what a prop bet is, a prop bet is basically a highly specific bet uh, where you could basically bet on the method of victory. So for example, if we look at the main event between Israel Adesanya and Jan Blakovic, Blakovic to win by knockout or TKO at 4.50, that would be a prop. So hit the like button if you want that. But for now, let's jump into these fights. And also, guys, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I would love to hit 5,000 subscribers. By the end of March, we're almost there. Let's get into the very first fight that I want to talk about in this video, which is going to be Alexander Rakic versus Thiago Santos. Now, a few moments ago, I told you guys that this was a very, very interesting card for betting, and all of the main card fights do present us with some interesting opportunities to you know place some bets or at least think about placing some bets and you know out of all of the fights on this card i would say that the fight between alexander rakic and tiago santos is probably the least interesting from a betting point of view this is only because both of these fighters have extreme weaknesses that the other may be able to exploit. And for that reason, I don't really see a strong position on each uh, on either side. And it's not really the kind of fight that I would like to bet on. So let me explain. In fact, actually, let's take a look at the X factors first of all. So one of the biggest X factors to take in, into consideration in this matchup is the age, right? Thiago Santos turned 37 years old last month, and now he's definitely in the tail end of his career. We know the fighters, when they start to reach the age of 33, their bodies start to produce significantly lower levels of testosterone every year, and therefore their athletic performance declines significantly from year to year, where the further an athlete gets away, or the further a male athlete gets away from from the age of 33, the faster their body starts to decline. So with Thiago Santos at 37 years old now, won't be long but, but you know before father time starts knocking on the door and we will start to see you know big declines in Thiago Santos's athleticism, speed, explosiveness, reflexes pretty soon. And what we do know about fighters who decline with age is that their decline can often come very suddenly and out of nowhere. You know, wasn't that long ago that Thiago Santos suffered two really significant knee injuries against John Jones. And to suffer those kind of injuries, 
isn't great at the latest stage of a fighter's career when they're already probably dealing with a lot of chronic injuries they're already banged up and the rehabilitation process for knee injuries as significant as santos went through is not going to be easy i think the doctor the the ufc doctor that dealt with santos said that the knee injuries that santos faced in that john jones fight were some of the most significant that he had ever seen so can't be understated how much of an impact that might have on Santos. It's significant because with him being 37 years old, we know that father time is going to come knocking soon. And Alexander Rakic is only 29 years old. So for context, that eight-year age gap statistically gives Rakic a very big advantage. Younger fighters win around 67% of the time when there's an eight-year age gap in a fight. So if we're purely going off statistics, Rakic is definitely the right side to be on here. Because if we take a look at the odds on this fight, let me just get my uh, implied probability calculator up here. If we look at the odds on this fight, Alexander Rakic currently floating around average odds of about 1.65, which is minus 154 for an implied probability of 61%. You know, if we know the mathematical probability in the odds of Rakic winning is 61%, we know that if we can give him more than a 61% chance of winning, there's, there's going to be mathematical value there for us. Knowing that the younger fighter wins around 67% of the time when there's an eight-year age gap in a fight automatically gives us value there if we purely bet Rakic based off that statistic, which may or may not you know, be the smartest thing to do depending on your perspective on betting on MMA. If you're a heavy stats guy, you're probably just going to want to bet Rakic blind and let the stats produce the profit over the long term. But for someone more like myself, I prefer to look at how the fighters match up from a stylistic point of view and just use the use the statistics more as a more more as kind of like um more of like a, a reference point to build my case for for betting on either fighter where you know we say we do extensive research on these fights to figure out what the most likely outcome is and then we try to make the best decision possible with the information we've got available for us and certainly that age difference and that statistic is a key piece of information for us that we need to take into consideration in terms of the size Rakic is a little bit bigger, nothing major, six foot four with a 78 inch reach compared to Thiago Santos, who's six foot two with a 76 inch reach. So not a massive difference in size and reach. Although I will say that Thiago Santos did spend the majority of his career competing at middleweight, and Alexander Rakic is an absolutely huge light heavyweight. Rakic is a big, strong, physically imposing, natural 205 pounder. Whereas Santos is definitely on the smaller side uh, for a light heavyweight. So Rakic likely to be the more physically imposing fighter in this matchup. One more notable factor to take into consideration is that these two fighters have been training together over the last couple of years at American Top Team in Florida, which obviously presents a little bit of a problem because whenever you've got two fighters competing and they train together at the same gym, that obviously leads to some issues with the camp, right? Because you don't want coaches working with both guys because you know they may be able to share inside secrets on game plans and things like that. And obviously you don't really want to be you know, sharing the same training partners as well. We saw this issue recently when Gilbert Burns fought Kamaru Usman for the welterweight title. And now we've got it again at you know in Thiago Santos against Alexander Rakic. Fortunately for these two guys, they do train at one of the best gyms in the world, one of the biggest gyms in the world, American Top Team. And so ATT is no stranger to navigating these kind of complicated situations where you've got two training partners going up against each other. And so what we can see is that Thiago Santos has stayed at the main ATT gym in Florida. I'm sure if we keep scrolling, it won't take us long to find a picture somewhere there's one here he is uh just just uh two or three weeks ago two or three weeks ago uh, at the main att gym in florida so tiago santos's training has likely not been affected in any way uh, by the fact that 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 he trains with rakic he has stayed at the att gym in florida with his girlfriend uh, yana kunitskaya uh, but Alexander Rakic has moved. You still see uh, the American top team branding in the background there, uh, but he is actually training at a smaller ATT affiliate gym in Croatia, which 
isn't great because that essentially means he's training at a small regional gym. Even though that gym will carry the ATT branding, it's certainly not going to have the level of coaching or training partners that Thiago Santos is going to have in Florida. So this is notable and a big shout out to everyone that was watching the live stream research session uh, who was able to let me know that that's where Rakic has moved to. I really appreciate that, guys. You are my eyes and ears out there. You know what I mean? When we all work together, we're all better together. It's almost impossible for us to m miss these key details when we work together as a team. So shout out to everyone that watched the live stream for this fight. So those are the X factors out of the way. Now let's talk about why this fight is such a difficult fight for betting. Uh, in terms of how these guys match up statistically. So remember, you know, at the beginning of the breakdown, I said that both these guys have significant weaknesses that the other can exploit. And that's what makes this very difficult for betting. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to bet. So when I give you guys advice, that's just my perspective on how I think, uh, how, how I think things should be done based on, you know, a decade of experimentation and based on the fact that I do do this for a living. Personally, my approach to betting is to try and find strong positions to put my money. And when I'm digging for strong positions, I'm looking to bet on fighters that don't have any significant weaknesses that their opponent can exploit. The only exception to this rule is if there's a huge upside in the odds. And what I mean by that is I can excuse some element of weakness if the risk to reward ratio is very good in terms of if I can just bet a little bit of money to potentially win a lot of money. Those are the situations where I'll take on more risk and not necessarily put my money in a super strong position. But I don't feel that's the case here because Santos is only a marginal underdog. Rakic is only a marginal favourite. And so with both these guys having significant weaknesses, there's not a great risk to reward ratio on either side because based on their past fights, it's very difficult to kind of work out which guy is going to exploit the other's weakness. What I'm basically trying to say is I think both guys have got a really good shot of winning this and therefore with their odds not being too far away from an even money payout, very, very difficult to find value on this one. So Rakic's main weakness is that he fights with his hands very low and he keeps his chin up high and exposed. Rakic utilizes a similar sort of striking defense to Israel Adesanya where because he's from a traditional kickboxing, uh, kickboxing, kick, kickboxing I said, because Rakic is from a tr traditional kickboxing background, he relies on head movement to evade his opponent's strikes. He relies on his ability to read what his opponent is going to do in order to get out of the way of their power strikes. And so he fights with his hands really low, chin up high and exposed. And when they come forward to attack him, he relies on his ability to use his length to just basically lean back and use head movement to evade that strike. Now, for the most part, Rakic is pretty good at doing that. His striker defense is, is, is pretty good to be fair. And that kind of striker defense, for the most part, has worked out well for him up until this point in his career. However, Rakic hasn't faced many strikers as dangerous as Santos, who can hit hard, as hard as Santos, and who can cover distance as quickly as Santos. And it's the covering distance part which is very significant for me here. Because Thiago Santos is one of these guys that is lightning fast. He can cover distance very, very quickly and deliver fight you know strikes with fight ending power in a fraction of a second so that's where i really worry for rakic here because rakic relies on his ability to read his opponent and see them come in and get out the way with his head movement but tiago santos is so explosive and he covers distance so quickly the rakic has only got to have a lapse in concentration and you know fail to read santos blitzing forward one time and he could easily find himself getting knocked out. One of the major problems with Rakic's style of striking defense is a lot of the time, you know, when you're moving back away from your opponent, it's difficult for them to knock you out because you're kind of moving away from them, which means when their shot lands, you're kind of, by moving back away from it, you're taking some of that, that, that power, some of that impact off the shot. But that isn't so much the case with Rakic because when he moves back, he leaves his chin up high and exposed, it's out there to be hit, and he is a little bit of a sitting duck to the knockout. He's very good at reading his opponent, he's very good with his head movement, but 
Santos only has to cover distance quick one time in 15 minutes, land clean on the chin, and Rakic could be in a lot of trouble here. And it's not like his chin is bullet bulletproof. You know, we saw him get dropped once or twice by Devin Clark with those crazy spinning attacks. So I do worry for Rakic here. But Santos is not without his own issues. Oh, one more weakness with Rakic as well. Uh, he does stand very heavy on the lead leg. We saw Vulcan Uzdemir completely hammer his lead leg with leg kicks. And so we know Santos loves to use leg kicks as well. So that's a potential weakness that Santos can exploit. But Santos isn't without his own weaknesses. There are things that he struggles with that Rakic can definitely exploit. So in Rakic's post-fight press conference or post-fight interview against Anthony Smith, he said that he would make no apologies for that being a boring fight because he understand, uh, understood how big of an opportunity it was for him and how he just needed to win. It was a boring fight. Rakic came out, got the fight to the ground in every round and just controlled Smith from top position for 15 minutes and chipped away at him with sure shots and ground and pound. After the fight, Rakic said, look, I'm not going to take any risks. I'm not going to give this op guy an opportunity to knock me out. I'm going to take this path that I'm going to take the easiest path to victory and do what I need to do to win. I absolutely love that from Rakic because for me, it signals great fight IQ, you know, great, great game planning and also the discipline to stick to a game plan. He's not one of these guys that's going to be pressured into going out there and getting dragged into a war or putting on an exciting fight to please Dana. He's going to go out there to win, and I love that kind of fight because it shows a real deep level of intelligence that he's just going to go out there, do what he needs to do to get the win, and not put himself in any unnecessary danger. And that is quite that that that's quite notable because Thiago Santos' biggest weakness is his takedown defense and ground game. Santos is very, 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 very low level on the ground, ultra low level. And I know there will be the wiki cappers out there that will check Thiago Santos' Wikipedia page, see that he's got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and think this guy, you know, is okay on the ground. I, I get this all the time. Every single time we get a guy that is low, every time we get a fighter that's a low-level MMA grappler, but their Wikipedia page says they have a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I get bombarded with people telling me this guy. Well, you, how could you say he's bad on the ground? He's got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. What I would say is that not all black belts are created equal, and when I'm evaluating a fighter's grappling, I'm looking at their ability to defend themselves on the ground, work their way back up to their feet, attack with submission. Uh, because that's how we basically quantify the level that a fighter's MMA grappling is at. And what I can tell you is Thiago Santos is at an extremely low level on the ground. So I understand that his Wikipedia page will tell you he's got a black belt in MMA, uh, black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but in the context of MMA, it doesn't really mean anything. If this fight goes to the ground, I give Alexander Rakic a significant advantage. Rakic is very heavy from top control. Does it give his opponent hardly any space on the bottom to work their way back up to their feet if they do get taken down? He's got a very, very heavy top game and he stays very busy from top position with ground and pound, which makes it difficult for referees to get stand-ups. Thiago Santos is one of those fighters that doesn't really know how to work his way back up to his feet. And so if you do take him down, it's quite easy to rack up a lot of top control because he just tends to go to the close guard, accept being on the bottom, and just focuses on trying to defend himself on ground and pound as opposed to improving his, uh, his position on the ground or even working his way back up to his feet. The tricky aspect of this fight is that we haven't really seen any of Alexander Rakic's offensive wrestling. You know, when he fought Anthony Smith, he utilized a lot of grappling, but Smith basically pulled guard in every round, so we didn't really see any wrestling from Rakic. We only saw his top game. Similar sort of story in the Justin Ledet fight. Ledet kept going to the ground very, very easily, so we didn't actually get a chance to see any of Rakic's offensive wrestling. So we know Rakic will have a huge advantage on the ground, but we don't know if he's going to be able to get the fight to the ground. What I would say about Thiago Santos's takedown offense is that it's not good. It's very, very bad. But he does give you trouble on the initial takedown entry. So Thiago Santos is one of those fighters that uses his kickboxing in reverse to identify when you're going to come forward on a takedown entry. He's pretty good at reading the, the, the initial takedown entry. And when you drive in on him, he's very, very good at showing you strong hips and 
as you shoot in and try and get in on his legs and upset his balance, he's pretty good at clearing his legs, showing you strong hips, getting his back against the cage, and initially using the cage as a base to defend the takedown. When Thiago Santos is actually focused on defending takedowns, his takedown offense is very, very good. But Santos does make one huge mistake that a lot of fighters from a t traditional kickboxing background make. Jermaine Durand is one of the worst for it. Uh, Alex Caceres is pretty bad at doing it as well. Uh, that one's fresh in my mind because he, he did it last week against Kevin Kroom, which helped Kroom hit a couple of cheap takedowns. But the one weakness that Santos has in his skill set, and Mayra Bueno Silva's terrible for this as well. Uh, that's another memory from last week, which is what resulted in De La Rosa hitting a couple of takedowns. But basically, the weakness is when someone shoots in on Santos instead of him addressing the takedown and trying to deal with the takedown and stuff the takedown instead of him fighting for underhooks and focusing on just dealing with the threat of that takedown he'll try to throw elbows or short punches or knees instead and so when he's throwing those strikes when his opponent's working for a takedown that often results in his opponent being able to get deeper in on his legs and it often makes it easier for them to upset his balance and take him to the ground this is one of those things that's quite an easy weakness to tighten up. Early in Joanna and Jacek's career, because she came from a traditional Muay Thai background, she was very, you know, she was she was uh, very guilty of this weakness. Where you know, when girls would shoot in on her, she would stuff the initial takedown and then start to throw strikes and then inevitably get taken down. And as soon as she stopped that, her takedown defense improved exponentially. This is such an easy weakness to improve. And I believe it's why Mayra Bueno Silva and Alex Caceres' takedown defense has improved so much because they're starting to do that less and less. They still show flashes of it, but they're doing it less and less. But at 37 years old, Santos continues to do this over and over and over again. It keeps getting him into trouble and he doesn't appear to be learning from his lesson. If you go back and watch his last fight against Glover Teixeira, you can see that pretty much every single takedown that Santos gave up in this fight was because when Glover shot in on an, on an initial takedown, takedown entry instead of trying to defend the takedown he tried to land shots on Glover and resulted in Glover driving through using some chain wrestling to get the takedown so this is one of those fights where I don't see a strong position on either side because if the fight stays standing with how how Rakic kind of leaves his chin out there to be hit there's a really good chance that Santos knocks him out However, with how bad Santos is on the ground, there's a pretty good chance Rakic gets his fight to the ground and absolutely dominates. So it's a complex fight. It's a very difficult fight for pre-fight betting, but it's an interesting fight. This one could go either way. I don't see a strong position on this fight. Uh, but let me know in the comments below what you think and if you'll be betting this one. We now go into uh, the next fight, which is going to be Drew Dober against Islam Makachev. So if we take a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Islam Makachev, currently one of the biggest favorites on the card at about 1.29, which is minus 345 for an implied probability of 78%. If we take a look at the odds on Drew Dober, uh, which is currently around about 3.90, that's two, uh, plus 290 for an implied probability of 27%. So when I look at the odds on this fight, I really feel like the, the, the bookies have set the odds in a way that they're trying to deter people from betting this matchup because they just don't want action. And the public haven't really moved the odds from there. What I mean by that is the way the bookies have set the odds here Maybe I should say this after I break down how these guys match up for a technical point of view. But I feel the way the bookies have set the odds here is they've set Makachev as a big enough favourite where people won't be able to find value on him. But they've set the odds on Dober where he's in that underdog territory where you're not really getting that much upside for betting him either when you take into account how big his weaknesses are that Makachev is likely to be able to exploit. Let me explain. So, classic striker versus grappler matchup. Makachev is a truly excellent grappler and Drew Dober is a truly excellent striker. Makachev is very, very good at just basically wet blanketing you and ragdolling you, right? Once Makachev gets a hold of you, is suplex city he's an absolute nightmare his offensive wrestling is brilliant his grappling control is brilliant his chain wrestling is brilliant and one of the things that makes makachev the most scary is that 
His grappling is just as formidable in round three as it is in round one. This guy just doesn't slow down. His grappling is just totally a nightmare to deal with. And that's significant because when we talk about Aljamain Sterling later on in the video, we can really start to appreciate how good Islam Makachev's grappling is because not all good grapplers are created equal. And Makachev is truly at that elite level. That is what makes this a very tricky fight for Drew Dober because Dober is a very, very dangerous striker. He's a brilliant southpaw striker. Dober loves to come forward, put a lot of pressure on his opponents, force them to fight in an uncomfortable range, force them to fight on the back foot, react to what he's doing. Dober relies on his ability to use his power, his speed, his movement to put his opponents into a defensive shell. He's very aggressive. Very technical, hits hard, beautiful combinations. Dober is an absolute nightmare standing. And for that reason, I understand to some extent why I see a lot of people in my live streams asking if I think Dober is a decent underdog bet. My answer would be no, but that is taking absolutely nothing away from Dober. I think he's a brilliant fighter. The reason why I don't think Dober is worth a bet here is because Dober's biggest strength is unfortunately also the root cause for his biggest weakness. Dober likes to come forward recklessly with tons of pressure and just smother his opponents and put them into a defensive shell. But because he comes forward so aggressively, he doesn't really respect the danger in his opponent. And because he comes forward so aggressively, he doesn't give himself much time or space to read what his opponent is doing because he's trying to force them into fighting in this very tight, uncomfortable range. And so because he's coming forward so aggressively, when they level change and come back at him, he is a sitting duck. And this is why his takedown offense is so bad. If we look at Dober's uh, tail of the tape here uh, on, on UFC stats, we can see that his takedown offense is only 58%, which is pretty poor. When you look at Dober's fight record, dating all the way back to you know 2013, over the last sort of eight years, you can see that you know Dober hasn't fought that many really, really strong wrestlers. You know, if we look through the guys that he's fought, you know, Olivier Aubin Mercier, strong wrestler, uh, but Camacho striker, Tucker striker, Berkman a striker, Polo Reyes a striker, uh, Hakarast is a striker, Hernandez has developed into a striker, you know, Gonzalez striker, Holtzman striker, Escadero's a grappler, uh, Jamie Vander, a bit of everything, Leandro Silva, predominantly a striker. Now, Nick Hines striker, Sean Spencer striker. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you look at, you know, Dober's losses over the few years, or if you look at Dober's losses over the last few years, they've all come against grapplers. So, Benil Darius caused him big trouble on the ground. Darius, high level in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Olivier Aubin Mercier was on the Olympic judoka team for Canada. Very, very strong grappler. Efrain Escadero, grappler, right? Submission loss, submission loss, submission loss. It starts to paint a little bit of a picture for Dober. This takedown defense stat of 58% is particularly bad because I don't feel that Dober has fought that many strong offensive wrestlers. If he had fought lots of strong F offensive wrestlers and his takedown offense was 58%, I'd be like, oh, well, okay, that makes sense. He's fought a lot of guys. Uh, you know, with very good offensive wrestling, but he hasn't. So this is an even bigger red flag for me. What I see from Dober is that he's an absolute nightmare standing, but it's very, very easy to shoot in on his hips, take him down and control him on the ground. Dober is a very, 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 very le low level on the ground. Um, what this, what I'm basically trying to say is, based on past performances. Makachev should be able to get this fight to the ground anytime he wants and completely ragdoll Dober on the ground. There's nothing that I've seen Dober do in his past fights which suggests he can stop Makachev from just ragdolling him here. Yes, it's possible that Dover can catch Makachev with something crazy and knock him out. You know, one of the things about Dover is he does train up in Denver, Colorado, uh, you know, at altitude. His gas tank's great. You know, he's very, very dangerous deep into a fight. He still carries knockout power in the third round. 
the problem is Makachev doesn't slow down. Like, Makachev can literally use Doba as a human basketball for three rounds without slowing down. Makachev's grappling is going to be just as effective in the final minute as it is in the first minute. So it's not like Doba can rely on wearing Makachev out to then hopefully have more success with his striking later on. It's not going to go down with it like that. So from my perspective, I can't bet on Makachev because in order to bet on someone in this odds range, they have to have pretty much no way to lose because they're such a big favourite. There's just not that much upside in betting them. That's not the case here because we know Doba's very dangerous standing, really, really good striker. And, you know, it's fucking MMA, right? Maybe Doba catches Makachev with something crazy. But on the flip side, I like to put my money in strong positions and I like to bet on likely outcomes. I can't do that with Doba because the probability of him being able to knock Makachev out is slim because Makachev's likely to be able to take him down whenever he wants and rack up so much top control. Doba's not going to be able to knock Makachev out off his back and he's not going to be able to do anything on the ground. So from my perspective, uh, betting on Doba is a little bit too speculative here. It's a little bit frivolous. It's not for me. I'm not saying Doba can't win, but I am saying it's very unlikely. So we now go on to the next fight, which is one I know everyone is interested in this week, and I'm certainly interested in this one. We're going to be talking about Aljamain Sterling against Peter Yan, or Piotr Yan, or however the fuck you pronounce his name. I'm very, very sorry, Yan, for making, uh, for butchering your name. I think you're a great fighter, though, dude. Please don't kill me. Um, let's take a look. Okay, so... Both these guys currently are dead even money. You can bet either of these guys for around 1.91, which is minus 110, which carries an implied probability of 52%. This is my favorite kind of fight to study, and I went very, very deep on my research with this matchup. These are the fights that I love because with both guys at around even money, if you can just lean one way or the other, if you can just go 60-40 one way or the other, you can often find a really strong position to put your money because the implied probability on both of these guys is roughly around 52%. So if you can lean just one way or the other, if you can find a slight edge for one guy, you know, you can get your money into a really strong position here by the numbers. And so what was super interesting about this matchup is that when I went into research in this fight, I heavily leaned towards Aljamain Sterling. I really, really felt Sterling would be a great bet here because we haven't really seen Yan's, you know, takedown offense tested in the UFC. He hasn't really fought any wrestlers. Sterling's getting better and better from fight to fight. And we have seen long periods of inactivity from Peter Yan in his fights where he just doesn't do a lot. He doesn't really pull the trigger. He's quite a low volume striker. And when you look at Aljamain Sterling, he fights at a very high pace, constantly chipping his, uh, away at his opponents with those long, awkward punches, you know, long, looping, range-finding kicks, those teep kicks, those leg kicks. And, you know, for that reason, you could see a situation where Sterling would be able to use his grappling to wear on Yan, steal rounds, take him down, control him on the ground, and also chip away at him and out-volume him with strikes. But this is why I say fight research is so important. Because when you work from hazy memories, your brain will play tricks on you. And this is one of those fights where, from hazy memories, I thought Aljamain Sterling would be a great bet here. But when I went and researched this fight, I could tell you there's no way I would bet Sterling here now. And I am all aboard the Piotr Yan train. I really, really think this is a good stylistic matchup for Yan for the reasons that I will do my best to explain to you and show you uh, in this breakdown. And um, this is actually a really tough fight for Aljamain Sterling. So I've done a complete 180 on this. And this is why I keep saying over and over and over again, the hard, hard work is undefeated. And fight research is just so important, man. You can't work from hazy memories because your brain will play tricks on you. It's like last week when we researched Jimmy Rivera and Pedro Munoz. When we studied that fight, it was so clear that it would be a difficult fight for Jimmy Rivera. And then we know what happened. Munoz came through for us in a big way. And it was a cheeky little underdog winner for us. So, I would strongly recommend that if you're thinking about an Aljamain Sterling this weekend, do your own research. Watch some fight footage and just be absolutely sure 
that you think Sterling's a good bet before you pull the trigger. I'm not saying Sterling can't win. I'm just saying at even money, there is absolutely no shadow of a doubt in my mind. I have 100% confidence that Yan is the right side to be on when you can bet both guys at the, exactly the same return. The risk to reward ratio on both guys is exactly the same. Yan's the better bet. Let me know in the comments below what you think about that. I know that's probably a controversial opinion. I know the majority of people are on uh, Aljamain Sterling here, but the majority of people were on Jimmy Rivera last week, and you know, fight research helped us see that would be a very difficult fight for Rivera. So let's get into why this is a difficult fight for Sterling. Where do we begin? It's a complex fight. So when you look at this fight, right, a lot of people are expecting Aljamain Sterling to be able to use his grappling to cause Peter Yan a problem. And I understand why they're saying that. Aljamain Sterling is a very, very strong grappler. Very physically imposing. He's got a brilliant wingspan. A really long 71-inch reach for the bantamweight division. That enables him to connect those long arms around his opponent's body and control them. He's a physical freak. He's so athletic. His ground game is devastating. You know, his back takes, his chokes. He's so fast. He's so dangerous on the ground. And he's so physically imposing. His offensive wrestling's good. When it comes to grappling... Sterling is pretty much the total package. It doesn't get much better. So I understand why people are feeling like Sterling may be able to use that grappling to cause Yan a problem. Because if we look at Yan's record, hasn't really fought any strong wrestlers. He certainly never fought a wrestler or a grappler as skilled as Aljamain Sterling. Sterling is a whole new problem for Yan that he hasn't faced. You know, if we look at Yan's record just in the UFC, you know, Jose Aldo. You know, he's a striker. Uriah Faber is a grappler, but obviously Faber's never had the best offensive wrestling. And because of his size, he's always struggled to hold guys down. So that's not a fair comparison. Faber's nowhere near the level of Sterling. Rivera's a striker. Dodson's a striker. Douglas Silva de Andrade is a striker. Jinsu Son, striker. Taruto Ishihara, striker. Mateus Matos is a striker. So we have to go all the way back to 2017. To see the last time that 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 Yan fought a semi-decent grappler, which is Magomed Magomedov, and Magomed Magomedov is certainly not at the level of Aljamain Sterling. So what I'm going to do is, uh, while I talk about this fight, I'm going to play Peter Yan's fight against Magomed Magomedov from back in 2017 in the background, so you can kind of take a look at how uh, Piotr Yan look back 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 here and we're going to be looking at certain points in this fight to uh illustrate why i think it's going to be a very difficult fight for sterling but first of all let's talk about sterling's grappling and if you're thinking of betting sterling here i would very much recommend you go and watch some is some of his recent fights against pedro munoz jimmy rivera in particular to see what i'm about to describe for yourself so aljamain sterling is one of these guys that in round one is absolutely devastating. He is very physically imposing with his grappling, very strong in the clinch, has great offensive wrestling, really deep single leg and double leg takedowns. And if he gets you to the ground in round one, Sterling is an absolute nightmare. Now, earlier in Sterling's career, if we look back at you know his fights against Brian Caraway and Rafael Asuncao, and even his fights against like Rain and Barrow and Augusto Mendes. What we know about Sterling is that early in his UFC career, he used to come out the gate very, very aggressively, put all his energy into trying to get a finish in round one. And then if he didn't manage to get a finish in round one, he would fade very, very hard. You know, his, his cardio would fall off a cliff and he'd look very, very flat in the second and third round. He just didn't have the same physicality to his grappling in the second and third round as he did in the first. And that's why a guy like Brian Caraway was able to steal a split decision win from him. You know, in round one, Sterling gave Caraway hell. And then in the second and third, when Sterling started to fade, Caraway, Caraway was able to basically, you know, take over and finish the second half of the fight strong. With Sterling, he has made big improvements to his 
cardio over the years. There's no doubt about it. His gas tank is definitely better than it was back in the days of him fighting Ashen Sal and Caraway. But the same weakness definitely exists. That that weakness hasn't gone away. Sterling's just better at dealing with it and hiding it and fighting a little bit smarter to pace himself over three rounds. So early in Sterling's career, you'd see him come out very aggressive, you know, big, deep drives on those takedown entries, you know, explosive submission attempts, you know, heavy ground and pound, big physical grappling in the first round. And then he'd become significantly less effective in the second and third. That is still going on, 100%. If you go and look at, at, at Sterling's fights against Pedro Munoz, Jimmy Rivera, even though he won those fights, those fights followed the same blueprint. Sterling came out with tons of very physically imposing grappling in round one to put his opponent into a defensive shell and get them thinking about the takedown in round one. He then didn't really grapple much in the second round. He just used his long, awkward style of striking to chip away at his opponents in round two. And then he kind of faded in round three and didn't do a lot. So Aljamain's new style of fighting is to be very aware of the fact that his grappling's not going to be as effective in the second and third round. So what Sterling tries to do is come out hard aggressive in round one, win round one decisively, leave enough gas in the tank for round two, to chip away at his opponent with strikes and outstrike him in round two, and then coast in the third round and hope he's done enough to win a 29-28 decision. That's Sterling's style of fighting now. And I think that is really going to get him into a lot of trouble against Piotr Jan, especially in a five-round fight. Because even if Sterling can come out and cause Jan big trouble in round one, I'm not convinced he's going to have the energy or physicality in his grappling to do it in the second, in the third, in the fourth, in the fifth. Sterling is one of these guys that can, becomes significantly less effective as the fight goes on. The only difference now is that when he was fighting Caraway and Asun Sao, he wasn't used to feeling tired or flat in the cage. And so when it happened, he would panic and he would, you know, make the situation work, and he would gas very fast. Now, because he's got that experience of feeling tired after round one, he's better at keeping a poker face and hiding it from his opponents, and he's more effective at fighting while tired. He's also improved his gas tank a little bit, but with Sterling, he's just become a hell of a lot better than pacing him. A hell of a lot better at pacing himself. He's also better at pacing himself in terms of, you know, maybe when he was early in his UFC career, he did throw everything into that first round. Whereas now, you know, when he's really exerting a lot of energy in round one, maybe he holds back a little bit, thinking, you know, I need to keep a little bit of something, something for the second and third. So that's the state that Sterling's in right now. I think that's really going to get him into a lot of trouble here because. Peter Yan is the exact same fighter in the fifth round as he is in the first round. He never slows down. His hand speed never dips. He is literally just the same Peter Yan in every single second of the fight. If anything, Peter Yan starts really slow and gets better as the fight goes on, which is what you want, right? You want to be at your best when your fighter is at their worst. So if Aljamain Sterling starts fast and finishes strong, if he if Aljamain Sterling starts up here and goes like this, and Peter Yan starts here and goes like this, that's what you want, right? Because it means in the fourth and fifth round, when Sterling's at his most tired and at his most flat, unable to defend himself because his arms are heavy, he's breathing heavy, he's tired, that's when Yan's going to be at his most dangerous. And so if we really consider, you know, how... If we really consider, you know, what is the probability that Sterling's going to be able to cause Peter Yan a problem with his grappling, I really don't think he is. I don't think Sterling's grappling is really going to cause Peter Yan a problem. You know, you can see him in these positions. He's he, He's got decent takedown defense. You know, he's got a decent ground game. What I would say about Peter Yan is, even though we haven't seen a lot of his takedown defense and ground game, what we do know is that for the past five or six years, he has been training at the, the, the two best gyms in MMA, American Top Team and Tiger Muay Thai. I issue a challenge to you right now. Leave a comment below and name 
any fighter in the bantamweight or featherweight division that has trained at ATT or Tiger Muay Thai for any length of pe- any length of time and has bad takedown defense. Go. Just name someone. Because they don't fucking exist. They don't exist. If you train at Tiger Muay Thai and ATT for five or six years in the lower weight classes, there is a very high probability that your takedown offense is absolutely bulletproof. I genuinely can't think of anyone that's easy to take down and hold down that spent that amount of time training at these gyms. You know, Peter Yan is only 25 years old when he fought Magomed Magomedov here. Look, he's got the Tiger Muay Thai shorts on. There you see the Tiger Muay Thai logo, right? He was only 25 years old when he fought Magomed Magomedov. That was three years ago. Since then, he's had so much experience. And during his camps for all these fights, he's been training at the best MMA gym in the world. He already had a solid foundation to work from when he trained at Tiger Muay Thai. And now he's training at the main ATT gym in Florida with some of the best coaches, best training partners in the world. He's going to be significantly better now in 2021 than he was back in 2020, uh, 2017 when he fought Magomed Magomedov. And Peter Yan's takedown offense and ground game looks pretty good in this fight. What I really like about Peter Yan's takedown offense and ground game is that he's very, very scrambly. He's like a ball of energy. Peter Yan reminds me a little bit of all the team alpha male alumni. We think about guys like... Danny Castillo, Uriah Faber, Chad Mendez, uh, you know, uh, Cody Garbrandt, TJ Dillashaw. All these guys are trained at Team Alpha Male for an extensive period of time. They're all almost impossible to take down and hold down. You can take a guy like Dillashaw down. You could take a guy like Cody Garbrandt down. But holding them down is damn near impossible. And we see that with Peter Yan. Just look at this position here. I'm not saying Magomed Magomedov is as good of an offensive wrestler as Sterling. But the things that you see Yan do in these grappling positions will make him very, very difficult to take down. You see Magomed Magomedov walk him over to the cage here. And because Yan is so athletic, so confident, confident in his balance... He just feeds him the lead leg. Look how he's inviting Magomedov to try and take him down off this lead leg, single leg here. He's just feeding him the lead leg. And eventually, Magomedov takes the bait, starts working for a single leg. And as soon as Jan hits the ground, like a cat, he immediately posts off the canvas and scrambles back up to his feet. Then gets the underhook on the right side and turns into Magomedov. And if we just scroll through, there's just countless examples like this. You know, look at this. Magomedov drops down, attempts a double leg here, and Yan just reads him, shows strong hips, clears his legs, gets the overhook on the right side, and because of that, Magomedov can't get near Yan's legs and eventually he has to give up on the takedown attempt. What I really like about Yan as well, which makes it really difficult to take him down, is that he always keeps his hips square to his opponent. He's got brilliant balance and very, very strong hips. You always see Yan quickly turn into his opponent when they try and get on a body lock and try and take him down. You'll see it here. He's got this overhook on the right side. And watch how he just turns into Magomedov here. Anytime Magomedov tries to get in on the hips or legs, he just turns in square to him which makes it very, very difficult for Magomedov to upset Yan's balance because of how strong Yan's hips are. And you can see Yan's just very, very comfortable here. Now, remember what I said. St- you, you see it here. You see it there, right? You see it there. Perfect example. Remember what we said about Yan keeping his hips squared to Magomedov. Watch. Magomedov uses this body lock to drag Yan, Yan off the cage. But look at the balance of Yan and how square he keeps his hips to, to Magomedov. Watch this. So... For most guys here, there's a risk that Yan's going to have his back taken. But notice how Yan never lets his opponent get 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 their leg behind his leg. He's not going to let Magomedov get his left leg behind his leg here. Because if he does that, Magomedov can use his body lock to upset his balance and hit an outside trip. So to take this position away from Magomedov, Yan just moves square to him. Look at this. Look at this. As soon as this leg starts to creep around the back of Yan's leg, Yan just turns in. Watch this now. Immediately breaks the grip and just turns into him. And look how he gets his right leg back on the outside. Yan understands these positions very well. And this fight took place three years ago. Yan is going to be so much better now. If we just continue scrolling through, there's going to be so many examples like this 
where Yan is just able to use his strong hips to keep the fight standing. Here's another example, right? Everything comes from the hips of Yan. Yan's hips are so strong. Magomedov comes forward, ties Yan up, and Yan again, strong hips, and then turns into him, keeps his hips square. Everything comes from the hips of Yan. Very, very difficult to upset his balance. And this is just something that happens over and over and over again in this fight. We can keep, we can keep going. We can keep going. So that you can see Yan's takedown offense hold up time and time again. So Magomedov now, second round. He's got this body lock. Yan keeping his hips square to him. Always turning into him. Magomedov keeps trying to get to the back and Yan's always turning into him. Look at this scramble. Look at this scramble and how square Yan stays to Magomedov. Watch. See how square he stays? He's always facing him chest to chest. And his hips make it really, really difficult to upset his balance. And when you do upset his balance, he's like a cat. Most guys from this body lock position are looking to upset your balance so they can sneak this left leg around your back and start to take you back. But Yan does a great job of using his hips and this overhook to just block the path of Magomed and just scrambles back up to his feet like a cat, turns into Magomedov, and just takes the position away. And the most important thing about these positions is that is these takedowns. It's demoralizing for Magomed Magomedov to exert all this energy to try and take Yan down, only to see Yan immediately pop back up to his feet like a spring. Remember what we said about Sterling. Sterling's grappling becomes a lot less effective as the fight goes on. That's another brilliant example of why Yan does well here. Sterling's grappling becomes a lot less effective as the fight goes on and he becomes a lot less physically imposing as the fight goes on. So what we can see from Yan is because Yan is very scrambly, because he's very good at immediately exploding back up to his feet when he gets taken down, Sterling's going to have to exert a lot of energy to try and get this guy down and keep him down, which is only going to accelerate the rate at which Sterling slows down and then compound the problem Sterling's going to have of Yan boxing his face off when he does get tired. Yan can keep defending takedowns like this for 100 rounds. Sterling can't keep bringing the takedowns for more than a round or two. And just look at little positions like this. Peter Yan works for his own takedown, you know, not the smartest thing to do. He exposes his back here. He's at risk of having his back taken if his opponent can just clear his right leg from this single leg and move to take the back. But as soon as Yan senses that this might be happening, again, look at how Yan turns into Magomedov. It is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And this is what you see Yan do over and over and over and over again. I would strongly recommend going and watching this fight uh, so you can see for yourself. But while I wrap this one up, I will just uh, leave this fight running in the background. So, I think Peter Yan is a pretty solid bet here because I don't see Sterling being able to cause this guy a, grappling, uh, a problem with his grappling for more than maybe two rounds. Two rounds absolute maximum. I believe after round one, Sterling's going to find it really, really difficult to get his wrestling going. He might cause Yan hell with his grappling in round one, but I think Sterling's going to have to exert so much energy to cause Yan trouble with his grappling that by the third, fourth, and fifth round, his grappling's going to be mostly ineffective. And then the fight turns into a kickboxing match, which could be big trouble for Sterling. Now, I do have some big issues with Yan striking. I don't like how low volume he is. Yan is one of these guys that relies on his ability to just kill you. And for that reason, there are long periods of inactivity in his fight where he's trying to get you know, get a read on his opponent. He's trying to find his range. He's trying to bait his opponent into making a mistake so that he can punish him with a big counter and knock him out. That leads to long periods of inactivity where he often gets outstruck. If we look at the Jimmy Rivera fight as a perfect example... Yan was losing the first two rounds of that fight up until he were able to land, you know, big flash knockdowns at the end of those rounds to steal those rounds. Yan's problem is that he allows his opponent to rack up major volume on him while he downloads information on how to punish them for any little chinks in their armor they have, any little weaknesses in their striking defense. That's quite significant because Sterling is a high volume striker. 
He's very unorthodox. He's very awkward. He loves to chip away at his opponents with those, you know, long looping hooks, those jabs, those teep kicks, you know, those range finding kicks. He loves to chip away at the lead leg. And I do think Sterling can rack up a lot of volume on Yan. The, the reason why I do feel that Sterling's in trouble here, though, is because something really, really, really notable happens in Yan's fights when he gets to a point in a matchup where he doesn't respect your striking anymore. Yan is one of these guys that takes his time to feel you out and see what you're bringing to the table. You know, he let Jose Aldo hammer his leg and hurt his leg. You know, he let Jimmy Rivera chip away at him and outstriking him. But there comes a point in a Peter Yan fight where he's worked you out. He's got his timing, he's got his range, he's settled into a rhythm, he sees everything you're throwing at him, and quite frankly, when it reaches the stage in that fight where he's downloaded all that information, you are fucked. This guy has got a killer instinct like I've never seen before. If you go back and watch the Uriah Faber fight, Yan started pretty fucking slow. Yan didn't really do anything for the first 3-4 minutes of this fight until he'd defended a few takedowns that Faber had shot gotten into a few exchanges with Faber and as soon as it reached the point where Yan realized Faber, Faber wasn't going to be able to take him down and wasn't going to be able to hurt him with strikes he literally went into Terminator mode came forward and completely murked Faber as soon as he reached the point in the fight where he didn't respect Faber and didn't see him as a threat he just fucking killed Faber and it was as simple as that we saw him do exactly the same thing against Jose Aldo and exactly the same thing against Douglas Andrade and that's why I think this is a very very difficult fight for Sterling because Sterling is an awkward striker he's an annoying striker he throws a high volume of strikes and it's very difficult to get inside on him because of how long he fights. But Sterling isn't a dangerous striker. Doesn't have any power in his hands and he will not frighten Yan with his power or technique. I worry that if Sterling can't tie Yan up and take him down or control him and contain him in the clinch... Once Yan feels that Sterling kind of just throws out these long range finding strikes that can't hurt him, Yan is literally just going to walk Sterling down, show him no respect, and fucking kill him. That is my big, big, big issue with Sterling. I don't think Sterling can get the respect from Yan that he's going to need to to keep Yan in a defensive shell for as long as higher level strikers like Jimmy Rivera, John Dodson and Jose Aldo have been able to do. You know, Jose Aldo was hurting Yan very bad. He kept, you know, Peter Yan in a defensive shell for a decent amount of time. It took a while for Yan to open up. I don't feel Sterling poses the same threat to Yan standing that Aldo did. And so this fight is likely to get ugly for Sterling pretty early on. So this is a difficult fight all round for Aljamain. If I felt confident that he could grapple hard for five rounds, I would be very tempted to bet Sterling. But I think after the first or second round, this turns into a kickboxing match. And I just don't think Sterling has the technique or the power in his hands to gain respect from Yan in there. I think Yan is going to be able to turn Sterling into a panic wrestler from the third round onwards. And from there, it should be one-way traffic. Having said that, Sterling is a fucking nightmare in round one. And Yan's takedown offense and ground game isn't bulletproof. If Sterling comes in with a really grappling heavy game plan, drags this fight to the ground, I think he can put Yan in a lot of trouble in round one. But because this is a five round fight, because of the probability of Sterling finishing Yan in round one is so slim, undoubtedly for me the stronger side to be on here is Peter Yan. If you want to bet this fight, it's got to be Peter Yan. There's, there, there's no debate for me. So let me know in the comments below what you think. I know this will be a controversial one because majority of people watching this will be leaning towards Aljamain Sterling. If you are, strongly recommend you do your own research. Just bear in mind before you call me out on anything I've said, I did spend about two hours researching this fight. So if you haven't put that similar level of work in, consider uh, whether your opinion on this fight is going to be accurate. So, you know, let me know in the comments below what you think. But I do think PEN is a reasonably good bet here. Moving on to the co-main event of the evening. We have got Amanda Nunes against Megan Anderson. So, just to let everyone know, in fucking Wales, where I'm from, this name is pronounced Megan. It's Megan Anderson. 
whenever I talk about a Megan Anderson fight, there's always people in the comments that say, uh, it's fucking Megan. It's Megan. It's not Megan. Well, it's fucking Megan in Wales, bitch. So I'm going to call her Megan, okay? Megan Anderson against Amanda Nunes in the co-main event. So Amanda Nunes, the biggest favourite on the card. She is currently around about a 1.08 favourite, which is minus 1,250 for an implied probability of 93%, which always makes my eyes water. Uh, when you see a fighter in this odds range because ultimately this is a cage fight to the death with only two outcomes so whenever I see a fighter in this odds range always gets my spidey senses tingling and I would recommend that if ever you see a fighter this big of a favor in MMA always always take a close look at their opponent because you will almost always find a little bit of value in their opponent because of how dangerous a sport MMA can be. If we take a look at the odds on Megan, Megan, whatever the fuck you want to call her, Megan Anderson, uh, she's currently around about an, an, an 8.0 favorite, uh, 8.0 underdog, which is plus 700 for an implied probability of 12.5%. So, I think this is one of the most interesting fights on the card from a betting point of view. There I fucking said it. There I fucking said it. I said it. I said it. And I know I'm going to take a ton of shit from people over this. But let me know in the comments below what you think. Let me explain. Let me explain. If we look at the odds on Amanda Nunes, she is currently around about a 1.08 favourite. Minus 1,250 for an implied probability of 93%. 93. 93%, guys, okay? If you understand probabilities, you will know that this number here basically means that the bookies believe Amanda Nunes have, has virtually no way to lose. And in order to find value on Amanda Nunes, she has to have virtually no way to lose. She literally needs to be Robocop in order to deserve odds like this. Because at the end of the day, even, Robo, even Robocop's not invincible, right? Last time I checked Amanda Nunes' Instagram, she wasn't a fucking android. Uh, and she definitely wasn't a robotic police officer. So... She ain't fucking Robocop, which means these odds are a little bit insane. These odds are crazy because before you even get into a fight from a stylistic point of view, there are lots of ways that Amanda Nunes can lose this in terms of the X factors. Maybe she has a bad weight cut. You know, maybe she has had sickness or an injury during training camp, which has prevented her from training properly. You know, maybe she suffers from crippling nerves and performance anxiety on the day of the fight, which has an adverse effect on her performance. Maybe when she makes a walk to the octagon, she's just not feeling it like she usually does. You know, maybe her motivation's not there. We all have bad days at the office. We hear fighters talking about this stuff all the time. Maybe Amanda Nunes throws a leg kick in the first minute and breaks her ankle or snaps her shin in half like Anderson Silva. Maybe she throws a punch and breaks her hand. Maybe she throws a punch and breaks her hand and has a bone sticking out and suffers a compound fracture like Josh Emmett a few years ago against John Tuck. Maybe Megan Anderson lands something crazy, like maybe a head kick that she landed on Kat Zingano to, you know, scrape the eyeball of Zingano and result in the fight being, you know, stopped. Maybe, maybe, you know, Anderson lands an elbow off her back, cuts Nunes really bad, and the doctor stops it. Maybe Nunes fucking, you know, blows her knee out or something in the fight. Before we even get into how these girls match up from a stylistic point of view, these odds are a little bit wacky because these two girls are going to fight to the death in a cage, in their underwear, and there are only two outcomes. Two fighters enter, one fighter leaves, right? That was the whole UFC slogan. Either Nunes is going to win or Anderson's going to win. But you can get a 7-1 to one return on your money if you bet on a cage fight to the death where there are only two outcomes. That is always interesting to me. And now I know this is a very tough stylistic, stylistic matchup for Megan Anderson, but Nunes has weaknesses which we'll discuss in a moment but just 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 understand this for all the reasons i've just mentioned these odds are already a little bit stupid you know 
in order to justify these kind of odds, you have to have basically no way to lose. I'm talking about, you know, Khabib versus Darren Elkins type matchups. You know, I'm talking about fucking, you know, take your pick, take your pick. I'm talking about Valentina Shevchenko versus Hannah Cyphers type matchups. That's what these odds should be reserved for. These odds tell you this human being has no way to lose. This, these odds say, these odds say, even if Megan Anderson comes into this fight in full tactical riot gear with a shield, a fucking shotgun, two attack dogs, and some fucking grenades, and a sword, and throw in some fucking pepper spray while you're at it, she still can't win. That's what these odds are telling you. 93% implied probability. That ain't the fucking case here, ladies and gentlemen. There are things Anderson can do which will cause Amanda Nunes a problem. Will is a strong word. There are things, um, there's, there are things Megan Anderson could do which could cause Nunes a problem. So let's get into them. I'm going to have a quick drink right now. Let's talk about it. Okay. So, there's a few X factors at play. Which... Could lead to a banana slip from Amanda Nunes. The first being... She has been the champion for a very long time. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. She's on an 11 fight win streak. And... I don't really know which other way to put this, but there is a phenomenon in MMA where long-reigning champions just get bored of being the champion. It reaches a point where they just don't enjoy the weight of being the champion anymore. They don't enjoy having the target on their back. They don't enjoy having the unpleasant aspect of everyone else in the division talking shit about them. They don't enjoy all the extra media work, all the extra pressure from the promotion. Champions in the, in the UFC over the years, dominant champions, have often reached a point where they've made enough money and they've achieved enough within their career where they're just quite happy not to have the weight and the pressure of that belt hanging over them anymore. Good examples of this would be Jose Aldo. It reached a point in his career where he was fighting more not to lose than going out there to fight to win. It was kind of like damage limitation. It was self-preservation. Aldo was going out there to kind of chip away at his opponent and steal rounds. And if he ended up losing a decision, so be it. It was all about protecting that legacy and not taking too much damage. We saw George St. Pierre go through the same thing. We saw... Max Holloway, I believe, go through the same thing. You know, the Max Holloway that fought, you know, Vulcan, uh, the Max Holloway that fought Alexander Volkanovsky the first time wasn't the same Max Holloway that fought Calvin Cater. It looks like Calvin's got, you know, it looks like Holloway's got that fire back now, but he lost it for a little bit. And this is a phenomenon we have actually seen fighters talk quite openly about, particularly with female fighters. I'll give you a couple of examples. If you go back and watch uh, Rose Namajunas when she lost the title to Jessica Andrade, at the end of the fight, Namajunas looked happy that she had lost. She looked relieved that she didn't have the pressure of being the champion anymore. And she spoke quite openly about how that pressure was overwhelming for her. Ironically, we saw the same phenomenon when Jessica Andrade lost to Wei Lei Zhang. She looked happy when she lost the belt because she was quite happy just being any other fighter in the division, you know, living her passion, living her dream, fighting for a living. But she didn't enjoy the pressure of being at the top of the ladder with a target on her back with everyone looking to take her out. And one of the more relevant examples to what I'm talking about actually involves Amanda Nunes. This Chris Cyborg fight, when you look at Cyborg, she had been undefeated for an insane amount of time dating back to her fights in Strike Force. She had been in conflict with the UFC. She had had, you know, MMA fans and the media talk shit about her appearance and, you know, uh, attach her legacy to the use of performance enhancing drugs. 
She'd been the champion for a very, very, very long time. And this was actually a great stylistic matchup for Cyborg. You know, it, it was it was one of those fights where it was, it was ve- I will just say it was very unlikely Nunez would win. And what happened, Cyborg came out, went full kamikaze, came forward, tried to play rock'em sock'em robots with Nunez and got knocked out. It was a terrible performance from Cyborg. It was a complete implosion. It was a kamikaze style of fighting. And she kind of beat herself. I don't want to take anything away from Nunez. But if Cyborg would have fought smart, this one would have likely gone down very, very differently. But after the fight, Cyborg spoke openly about how happy she was that she lost the belt. She spoke quite happily about not having to be the champion anymore and how relieved she felt after losing the title. So whenever you have these really dominant champions, these long-running champions like Amanda Nunes, I always feel you've got to be very careful at betting them at big favor odds because one day they're just going to make that work and think, you know what, I'd quite like to just go back home after this fight with my girlfriend, Nina Ransarov, you know, with my new baby in my mansion, you know, and just live happily ever after. I'd love to take take my family to the beach every day and just live a cool, chilled, happy life. I'd quite like not to go on Twitter and see every other girl in the division talking shit about me. I'd quite like to not have to fucking do media every week. I'd quite like to not see fans talk shit about me on, on, on social media. And so you've always got to remember that age-old quote that it's difficult to wake up and do road work at 5am in the morning when you're sleeping in satin sheets. And when you have these long-running champions, that is always a concern. Contrast that to Megan Anderson. Very, very young in her MMA career. She's 31 years old. I would imagine, I don't want to make any assumptions, but I would imagine that Megan Anderson's contract in the UFC isn't great. I would imagine that Megan Anderson hasn't earned much money from the profession that she's dedicated her life to. I would imagine that Megan Anderson is very hungry, is very motivated and very determined to beat Amanda Nunes. I'd imagine she's worked harder than she ever has done before to come into this fight and give herself the best chance possible of beating Amanda Nunes. And so in terms of motivational trajectories, it's fair to say Nunes may be on a downward trajectory, Anderson may be on an upward trajectory, right? Different levels of motivation. And what's really interesting about Nunez's circumstance is that she has basically given us the biggest red flag of them all. And that is mentioning the R word. Now, the R word is very, 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 very important to take seriously. Very, very, very important. Amanda Nunez has spoken about retirement. Let me just see if I can find a better article. There's a lot of... uh... There we go. There we go. There we go. Right. There we go. There we go. What I can tell you... Look me in the eyes right now. Look me in the eyes right now. Because I know there will be tons of you watching this thinking this fucking guy is crazy. How can this guy be telling me Megan Anderson's a good bet? I understand, I understand, I understand. It's a different, difficult stylistic matchup. But look at me right now. Look at me right now, okay? I have been doing this for 12 years. I have made a disgusting amount of money betting on MMA. I do this for a living. And I make significant amounts of money every year betting on MMA. Look, looking you dead in the camera. Listen to me right now. With all my years of experience, with the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours I have spent researching fights, I can tell you with every single fucking millimeter of DNA in my body, every single fucking fiber of DNA in my body, I will look you dead in the eye and tell you right now, a huge percentage of the time, when a fighter mentions the word retirement just once, their career almost always falls off a cliff. Go back, look into it yourself, do some historic back testing and research. I could tell you right now, as soon as a fighter mentions the R word, it is almost always 
the beginning of the end because it signals that they've got one foot out the door already. They don't have the same level of motivation and determination that got them to the dance in the first place. And it is a sign that they're now focusing on leaving the sport. It's the law of attraction. If you believe things, if you think things, you tend to get pulled towards them. That's why if you have very positive, successful thoughts, you know, your life is more likely to play out in that way because subconsciously you'll make decisions which pushes you in that direction. When we talk about the law of attraction, it's not some voodoo bullshit where if you just think fucking happy unicorn thoughts every day, one day you'll own a unicorn. It's more about a mentality, whereas if you think positive, you're more likely to make positive positive life, life choices, right? In the case of Amanda Nunes, if you're thinking about retirement, sorry guys, my eye is itchy. If you're thinking about retirement, that's what your brain is going to be focused on. So when it comes to a decision between doing that business deal or making that investment or going to the gym and training your ass off because you know you've got a title fight coming up. Maybe you take that conference call over investing in that business or buying that property over, you know, doing an extra session in the gym. You know, maybe you think, I went to the gym this morning, man. It won't hurt if I just take this conference call with this investor. Do you see what I mean? Whereas Megan Anderson's in a different lane, right? All her eggs, all her chips are into her career right now. Building her legacy in MMA, getting that title. Nunes has done that. She's got a daughter to think about. You know, she's got, a, a, you know, I'm not sure if she's married to Nina Ansarov, but she's got, you know, a, a, you know a, a, a life partner to think about, you know. Nunes is 32. How long more is she going to fight for? You know, what, what does she have left to prove? What does she has le- have left to achieve? You know, two division champion. She's beaten everyone. She's beaten the GOAT cyborg. She's probably made a ton of money. What is there left to prove? So whenever a fighter mentions the R word, you need to take it seriously because I promise you, if you back test this theory, a fighter's career nosedives when they mention the retirement word. And you will also notice this. When a fighter mentions the word retirement, they'll always be like, oh, but I'm not retiring yet. I've got three or four fights left in me. Or, you know, I still want to win another title. Or, you know, I still want to beat this person. Or... You know, I'm still more motivated and hungry than I've ever been. You're not, but you're not, but you are not. Because history tells us that when you mention the word retirement, it changes everything. So that is a huge red flag with Amanda Nunes. So straight away, when we look at her odds, you know, maybe a weight cut, maybe injuries, maybe performance anxiety, you know, maybe a freak injury in the cage, maybe a disqualification, All of a sudden, you know, the retirement word, this becomes more of a silly number. This becomes more attractive. And we haven't even got into how they match up from a stylistic point of view yet. Now, before we go any further, don't think I'm telling you to sell your fucking car. Or, you know, spend your rent money on Megan Anderson. That's not what I'm fucking saying. Don't be a donkey dickhead. Do not be a donkey dickhead. Right? Making money in this game is all about putting your money in strong positions. Okay? I know that the probability of Megan Anderson winning this fight is extremely low. Right? It's extremely low. Right? The vast majority of time, Anderson's going to get destroyed here. You know, if she had a good chance of winning, she wouldn't be, you know, one of the biggest underdogs in, in an MMA fight, in a UFC fight in the last year. Don't be a donkey dickhead. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Don't come back next week and go like, ah, ha, 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 Anderson got knocked out in 30 seconds, you dumbass. How could you bet Anderson? Don't be a donkey dickhead. You will never get anywhere in life being a donkey dickhead. You, you, you just won't with that limited mentality. What I'm saying to you is the goal of making money in this game is to find strong positions to put your money and get favorable risk to reward ratios. In order for Amanda Nunes to justify these odds, she has to have no way to lose. And for the reasons I've described, that ain't the fucking case. So straight away, the value 
the decent risk to reward ratio here sits with Megan Anderson. And let's go a bit deeper. Let's get into how these girls match up from a stylistic point of view and how I believe Anderson can actually cause Nunez trouble from a stylistic point of view. So, Nunez's fighting style completely revolves around her ability to put her opponents into a defensive shell. Nunez, throughout her career, the one weakness that she has had are gas tank issues. Cardio has always been Nunez's biggest weakness. I don't think it's because Nunez isn't training hard in the gym. I think Nunez probably trains harder than anyone else in the gym. I think she's a complete warrior, a workhorse. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, if you make her work, her gas tank falls off a cliff. I think it's more to do with sinus issues. I've read over the years she's had issues with sinus issues. So maybe she's just not able to breathe properly in fights if you make her work. Maybe she can't get enough oxygen into the blood. For whatever reason, Nunez's gas tank is a little bit sketchy. But just like Sterling has learned to kind of deal with that and pace himself better over a three-round fight, Nunez has learned to do the same. There have been situations in her career where she's got herself into a lot of trouble in fights because she's gassed. But over the years, she's learned to adapt her style of fighting to balance her output out over a three-round or a five-round fight so that she doesn't gas. She slows down a little bit, but she's able to conserve energy enough to still be somewhat effective late on in a fight. The way she does this is she puts her opponent into a defensive shell, which is a very, very similar system to what a prime Tyron Woodley would use. The system basically involves coming out into the first round and hurting your opponent, or at least sending them a message. So in Amanda Nunes's, uh, you know, in... in um, you know, in in in, in Amanda in the world of Amanda Nunes, that usually involves catching them with something big or just letting them feel that power. What happens is because Amanda Nunes is so fast and so accurate and so powerful and so dangerous standing, because Nunes moves and hits like no one else in the women's division, when she faces these girls that challenge her for the title and they feel her power, it's like nothing that they've ever felt before. So straight away they're on the back foot. What happens then is they start to show Nunes respect. And this is perfect for Nunes because it then allows her to dictate the pace of the fight. When Nunes comes forward and lands that first big right hand on her opponent, straight away they're like, oh fuck, I definitely don't want to eat one of them. And as we know, when you put yourself in a position to hit your opponent, you also put yourself in a position to be hit. And so when they initially feel Nunez's power, that makes it less less that makes them reluctant to come forward and attack her because they don't want to get caught with that, that those power strikes, right? So when you see a lot of girls face Nunez, they're often very hesitant to attack her which makes life extremely easy for Amanda Nunes because she can pace herself. She can choose when to exert energy. She can control her heart rate, her breathing, her output, and she can manage her output over five rounds because she knows I can attack my opponent and it's unlikely they're going to attack me back because they're so scared of me. That is basically the way Nunes has adapted her fighting style to deal with her gas tank issues. However, when you make Nunez work, her gas tank falls off a cliff. She gets tired real fucking quick if you can make this girl work. If you go back and watch her fights, you know, early against Holly Holm, against Felicia Spencer, against Raquel Pennant, and probably the best example I could think of, you know, Nunez only really got going late on in that fight. Shevchenko, another great example. Um, you know... If you go back and watch those fights which have gone deep, you'll notice long periods of inactivity for Nunez. And what you'll also notice is if you make Nunez work in, in, you know, in, in short periods within a fight, immediately after that period, she will look absolutely gassed out of her mind. She gets flat-footed, her arms become heavy, heavy breathing, throws sloppy overhand rights. A really good example of this was the Jermaine Durandame fight. If you go back and watch the Jermaine Durandame fight, after every single takedown the Nunez hit, if Durandame was able to work back up to her feet, Nunez would look incredibly tired, 
Go and take a look at the end of the first and second round of this fight to see what I'm talking about. It's very notable. However, for the most part, Nunes has been able to get away with this because even when she starts to get tired, because she's put her opponents into a defensive shell with her power, they're reluctant to make her pay for that. And so this is so interesting to me because there are very, very, very few girls in the, the, you know, the women's divisions in MMA with legit one-shot KO power. Even if we look at the most devastating you know, fighter in women's MMA history, Chris Cyborg, not even Cyborg truly possessed legit one-shot KO power. You go back and watch Cyborg's fights, she would be one of these fighters that's more likely to just wear you down with volume and pressure and break you down slowly as opposed to just cracking you with that one shot and killing you dead. Nunes can do that, right? Nunes has legit one-shot KO power. Guess who else has legit one-shot KO power? Megan the fucking Anderson. This girl is so big, so strong, so physically imposing, so dangerous standing that she presents dangers to Nunes that she hasn't faced before. And when I say Anderson's big... I understand that when we use that word in the context of, uh, you know, of a uh, uh, female athlete, that could be a disrespectful term. I don't want to be disrespectful to Megan Anderson in any way. She is brilliant. She's beautiful. She's athletic. She's long. She's tall. She's got the perfect frame, the perfect wingspan for MMA. At six foot tall with a 72 inch reach for the women's division. She has such a huge physical advantage over everyone she faces. Because that wingspan makes her very formidable. It means that she can land big, big, big power punches from a range in which most girls are not able to counter. She is brilliant. She has huge weaknesses that I think Nunes can exploit and will likely will exploit. But Anderson presents challenges for Nunes we've never seen Nunes deal, before, deal with before. I would compare Megan Anderson in many ways to Drew Dober. So I know some people kind of just skip through this video and maybe only come to, you know, some fights. But if you've watched this whole video, a lot of the stuff that I said about Drew Dober also applies to Megan Anderson. You know, Megan Anderson's biggest weakness is her takedown offense and ground game. Let's be real here. A strong gust of wind is enough to take her down and she's a white belt on the ground. What's even more concerning is that I don't feel she's at the best gym to make improvements to these weaknesses. Megan Anderson is a very smart, very intelligent, you know, athlete, a very intelligent fighter. When you see Anderson in interviews, you know, she started to do desk work and media work as well. She's brilliant. She's so intelligent. She's going to understand what her weaknesses are. She's going to understand the areas that she needs to improve in. She's not a fool. She's going to know that her takedown offense and ground game are a big issue. And unfortunately, I feel she is training at a gym, which isn't very well equipped to help her with that. James Kraus is a brilliant coach, a brilliant trainer. I'm a big fan of James Crouch. Uh, Crouch, big fan of James Kraus. If we carry on scrolling through, we can see the the, the 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 beautiful back of his head there. But unfortunately, one of the things that plagued James Kraus through his career was his takedown offense and his ability to work his way back up to his feet. And we know that James Kraus has had a very very long career, right? He's had over 30 pro MMA fights. And this is still Krauss's biggest weakness. Even after so long, Kraus hasn't really improved that hole in his game. And what's even more concerning is fighters like Grant Dawson and fighters like Tim Elliott, who have trained with Kraus and under Kraus for a very long time, who have a base in grappling, also have pretty bad takedown defense. If you look at a strong grappler, for example, like Grant Dawson, he's a strong offensive grappler. He's tricky on the ground. But if you try and take Dawson down, his takedown offense is pretty bad. So while I completely think Kraus is a brilliant coach, and I think Megan Anderson is a super intelligent fighter that is going to be working really, really hard to improve her takedown defense, unfortunately, I don't feel she's at the best place to do that. So I've kind of got to cover that off. But, you know, shout out to James Kraus, dude. I think you're a genius. And, and I understand why Anderson would want to stay with him because he's a great guy, seems to really care about his fighters, and, you know, he's smart as fuck, right? Um, 
So that's obviously a big issue here because we know Amanda Nunes, high-level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, you know, decent offensive wrestling, good judo, and she's a nightmare on the ground. Nunes is one of these fighters that can inflict a massive amount of damage on the ground. Her ground and pound is absolutely nasty. But remember what I said earlier on. If you make Nunes work, she will slow down very quickly. And when you, you know, take your opponent down, when you try and grind them on the ground, when you, you know, you use a lot of grappling, that's one of the fastest ways to burn energy. And that's why I said, go back and watch the Jermaine Durandame fight, because there were windows, uh, or there, there, there were moments in this fight when Nunes looked very tired and very flat, because she had used so much grappling in that fight, she had burnt herself out. So if Nunes comes into this fight with a grappling heavy game plan, which would be a good idea because I think Anderson can cause her trouble standing. If Nunes comes in with a grappling heavy game plan. She risks burning herself out. And if she doesn't submit if she doesn't submit Anderson or stop her with strikes early on, she runs the risk of burning herself out and then finding herself in a position in the second or third or fourth or fifth round when she's got an absolute fucking murderer in front of her. The most notable fight for me when it comes to Megan Anderson that tells me Nunes may have her hands full here was Anderson's performance against Holly Holm. No one in Holly Holm's long, illustrious MMA career has been able to make Holm as uncomfortable as Megan Anderson did. If you go back and watch that fight, you can see from the very, very first second, Anderson had home in a state of panic. Anderson was the first fighter I've ever seen turn Holly Holm into a wrestler. Holly Holm got turned into a panic wrestler literally within 10 seconds. Anderson did exactly what Drew Dober did. Came forward super recklessly, didn't give a fuck about the level change or takedown, tried to punch a hole in Holly Holmes' head. And she fights very long, she's very accurate, and she hits very hard. That's notable for me, because, remember what I said, the thing that has made Nunes effective throughout her career is that she relies on her ability to put her opponents into a defensive shell so that she can pace herself over the five rounds. If you make her work, she will slow down. Remember what I said about Megan Anderson. She's a lot like Drew Dober. One of her biggest weakness, one of her biggest strengths is also one of her biggest weaknesses. Because she comes forward so aggressively, looking to take her opponent out and land that big knockout shot. She's putting a lot of pressure on her opponent. She's forcing him to fight in an uncomfortable range. She's coming forward very aggressively, not even thinking about the takedown, which ironically is one of the reasons why her takedown offense is so bad. She's not thinking about it, which means she often runs right into it. But that makes her dangerous because she won't respect Nunes like some of Nunes' past opponents have. And another thing about Megan Anderson, again, she's huge. She's beautiful. She's athletic. She's got the perfect body type and frame for MMA. But she is a big, physically imposing girl. You know, when you look at Amanda Nunes, 5'8", 69-inch reach, she's fighting girls like Felicia Spencer, Raquel Pennington. They don't have the same physicality as a Megan Anderson, it's going to be easier to put those type of body types, those types of fighters with, with, with that limited level of athleticism in a defensive shell compared to someone like Anderson, who's big, strong, athletic, physically imposing, you know, big upper body, big, you know, physically athletic shoulders. Maybe Nunes just can't hurt Anderson like she's hurt her previous opponents. And maybe Anderson just walks through uh, Nunes' power shots. Nunes is used to be able, it, Nunes is very used to being able to put people in a defensive shell by backing them up and getting them to kind of stand off and leave her alone a little bit so she can catch her breath, get her heart rate and breathing back under control. If Anderson doesn't play that game, if Anderson doesn't respect Nunes, just walks her down and tries to punch a hole in her head, I can't tell you how interesting this fight gets. So, it's a terrible stylistic matchup for Anderson because she has no takedown defense, no green of ground game, and Nunes absolutely, 1,000% has the, has the offensive wrestling to get this fight to the ground and the ground game to cause Anderson hell on the ground. Please don't. Please don't be a donkey dickhead and confuse my breakdown for confidence. 
I do not in any way, shape or form think Anderson will win. I do not feel confident that Anderson will win. Until she cleans up her takedown offense and ground game, she is always going to struggle. However, at these odds, I have to bet her. I just do. And I'm not going to bet much on her. It's only going to be a little bit. But the bookies have to take my money here because there are more than a few ways Anderson can win this fight. And you only need one or two ways to find value value when, when it comes to these odds. So let me know what you think in the comments before. I know uh, below. I know it's a controversial one, mainly because a lot of people watching these videos do not understand probabilities. Um... But all the upside here is with Anderson. She probably loses, but these odds are fucking insane. And Nunez should not be that big of a favorite. Okay, let's get into the main event. Let me have a quick drink. All right, it's been a long one. This is why I don't... Hey, for anyone that's wondering, this is why I can't do full event breakdowns, man. We go into so much depth on these fights that is all based on cold, hard research. That if I broke down every fucking fight, you know, these videos would be four or five hours long. It's, it, it, it's not sustainable. I can't talk like this for three, four hours, man. My throat's already a fucking feels like a carpet. My head's going to explode. Um, so I hope you appreciate that, man. I, I post breakdown videos to my website instead because I could do it in a bite-sized way. You know, throughout the week as we research each of the fights, I could just post an easy five, ten, easy five or ten minute video, you know, for the prelim fights to my website at my own pace, you know, throughout the week. Sometimes I don't upload those breakdown videos until maybe a Friday night or a Saturday morning. That's why I don't do the prelim videos, you know, on YouTube, because if I did put them on YouTube, you guys might be waiting until Friday night or Saturday to get this video, when I think most of you would prefer getting them earlier on in the week. So, you know, they, they, we, we've been going for about an hour and 30 minutes now, and I hope you appreciate it, but because we go into this level of depth, it is very hard to cover every fight. But if you do want breakdowns for every fight, you can get them on my website, MMABettingTips.com. There's our girl, uh, Megan Anderson, Megan Anderson, wherever the fuck you want to call her. And uh, yeah, you know, if you want breakdowns, you, you can get them on there. But it would be uh, it would be pretty grueling to do like a three, four, five hour video covering an entire card. I know a lot of people do do entire cards. Don't want to take anything away from them. But the vast majority of people that do entire cards are either wiki capping or they're working from hazy memories. They're not actually putting the work in, you know, spending hours researching these fights. It, it, it's just a different thing. I don't want to criticize anyone, but it's it, it's different. What they do is very different to what I do. And it is fucking tough to cover every fight, man, on, on a YouTube video. So let's get into the main event now. This is Jan Blakovic against Israel Adesanya for the main event. The main event of the evening. Uh, is he going for that two division, uh, two two division champion status? And uh, I think he stands a pretty good chance of getting it as well. Now I pissed off. I, I probably pissed off a bunch of people with my Jan and Sterling breakdowns. Will definitely have pissed people off with my Nunes and Anderson uh, breakdown, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to piss off even mo more people uh, with this Adesanya versus uh, Blakovic uh, breakdown. So let's get into it, man. Let's take a look at the odds. So we've got Israel Adesanya currently floating around about an average of 1.44, which is minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. And if we look at the odds on Jan Blakovic, Currently floating around about an average of, call it 3.0, which is going to be plus 200 for an implied probability of 33%. So, straight away, I believe that this could, this fight could really come down to one specific aspect that we don't have the answer to yet. So... Straight away, let's get grappling off the table. Let's just cover that because I keep seeing people say, you know, Blakovic might be able to take Izzy down and do this and do that. It's all the same shit we see people talk about in every single Izzy fight, right? People were saying when Izzy fought Whitaker, Whitaker would have been able to use his wrestling to take Izzy down and cause him trouble. We know it's bollocks. We know it's absolute bollocks. Izzy's takedown offense is very, very good. 
And he does a brilliant job of quickly scrambling up to his feet when he does get taken down. Izzy is very, very difficult to hold down. Jan Blakovic is very stiff, he's very rigid, and his offensive wrestling is not good. Jan Blakovic is one of these guys that just doesn't have the drive on his takedown entries to upset the balance of Israel Adesanya. And because Jan is one of these guys that's big and slow and cumbersome, he's not quick enough to react in grappling positions to tie Izzy up and establish a grappling position a grappling control when they hit the ground. Izzy is exactly like Peter Yan. When you take him down, he immediately looks to explode back up to his feet like a spring. And in order to take guys down like that and control them on the ground, you have to be just as fast as them to react when you hit the ground. Yan isn't like that. Even if he was, even if Jan Blakovic could get this fight to the ground, hold Izzy down and establish a dominant position. He doesn't pose much of a threat to Izzy on the ground because Jan Blakovic has a very, very low level ground game. Now I know the wiki cappers will come back out in force now and say, how can you say Blakovic has a low level ground game? He submitted this guy. He submitted that guy. I checked his Wikipedia page. It says he's got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Remember what I said earlier on in the video when we were talking about Thiago Santos. Not all black belts are created equal. And when I'm evaluating an MMA, an MMA fighter's grappling, I'm looking at their MMA grappling. I'm looking at their grappling skills in MMA fights. I don't care about how nasty their jiu-jitsu is in jiu-jitsu tournaments or how they look in the gym i'm evaluating mma grappling skills based on mma fights and from what i've seen from blakovic on the ground in mma fights he is not very good on the ground and in my opinion blakovic poses basically no threat to adesanya when it comes to grappling if you're asking me to kind of assign a probability as the you know how much of an issue i think blakovic could cause izzy with his grappling I would say like there's less than a 10% chance Blakovic causes Izzy a problem with his grappling. Take of that, you know, take take from that while you will. Um, so that's the grappling off the table straight away. Now I guess we kind of have to talk about size, right? Size is where this fight gets really, really interesting for me. In fact, no, let, let, let's talk about age first. Let's let's talk about age. Let's get into age. So Jan Blakovic is 38 years old. Israel Adesanya is 31 years old. Now remember earlier on what we said about the fight between Alexander Rakic and Thiago Santos. When uh, you know the male body reaches the age of 33, they start to produce significantly lower levels of testosterone every single year, which means the older you get past the age of 33 the faster your athletic performance is likely to decline. There will always be outliers. You'll get guys like DC, you know, that, that, that extend their career far beyond what is normal. But as a general rule, the vast majority of fighters are going to decline significantly from year to year past the age of 33. With Jan Blakovic now being 38 years old, it's only a matter of time before father time comes knocking. It's very unlikely that this guy will continue to improve at this stage in his career it's far more likely that one day he shows up and looks a shadow of himself this is mainly due to the fact that he's got a lot of miles on the clock as well he's not just a 38 year old fighter you know like uh you know he's not just a fighter in the tail end of his career like a yol romero or like a daniel cormier that started their mma careers very late on this guy has been in the trenches for a very long time. He's had around 35 pro fights and very, very early on in his career, he was thrown into the deep end fighting in a decent promotion in KSW. So Blakovic has spent a lot of time in fights, you know, a lot of time competing against a high level of opponent in a lot of wars, taking a lot of head trauma, in a lot of you know, taking a lot of damage. I remember what I always say, man, fighters are, you know, like a battery that cannot be recharged. You know what it's like. You put a battery in a torch. You keep using that torch. And after a while, the light starts to flicker and the torch doesn't work as well. Fighters are exactly the same. The more time they spend in a cage, the more time they spend in fights, the more head trauma they take, the more they decline, the less effective they become. So with Blakovic being 38 years old, having 35 pro fights, father time's undefeated, and it's only a matter of time before father time catches up with Blakovic. Maybe it catches up with him this weekend. Who knows? But Blakovic doesn't have many fights in him before he starts to significantly decline. We know that because, you know, history tells us father time gets everybody. 
in terms of the size, this is an interesting one because Easy does actually have the size advantage here in terms of wingspan. We know that when it comes to size, it's really wingspan that matters. It's not so much the height differential that matters, it's more so the reach differential. And as we can see, Blakovic is six foot two with a 78 inch reach, whereas Adesanya is six foot four with an 80 inch reach. That makes Adesanya a little bit longer and a little bit taller. And in terms of the age, because he's only 31 years old, he's also seven years younger than Blakovic. And remember what we said earlier on. When there's a seven-year age gap in a fight, the younger fighter will win around 67% of the time. So already, you know, I know 67%, 69% is roughly where the odds are on Adesanya. But already, if we're just going based off the statistics, due to the age, Adesanya is already way more likely to win than Blakovic. It's just a harsh reality. But the size issue here is an interesting topic because Adesanya is obviously moving up from the middleweight division and Blakovic is a big, strong, tough, physically imposing, light heavyweight that hits hard, right? We, we know that he's a strong dude. You can see it in his style. He's just very cumbersome in the way he moves, throws everything into his shots. And so this is an interesting one because while... In terms of the wingspan, Adesanya is a little bit longer and taller. There is the X factor of physicality in play here. And it's similar to what we were talking about with Megan Anderson against Amanda Nunes. Physicality does play a big role in MMA where you have to kind of ignore technique to some extent. And in certain situations, fighters just don't have the physicality to hurt bigger fighters than them. You know, really good examples that we've talked about were Conor McGregor in the first fight against Nate Diaz. Diaz kept coming forward over and over again, and Conor was lighting him up, catching him with big shots, dropping him, inflicting major damage. But Conor couldn't hurt Nate Diaz because Nate Diaz was so much bigger, so much stronger, that he just kind of smothered them in pressure and walked through everything that they threw at him. We saw Cyborg built a career off it, right? You look at Cyborg's fights against Julia Budd or, you know, Leslie Smith or Lena Landsberg or Tonya Evinger, anyone pretty much a Cyborg's ever faced. Cyborg could literally just walk forward in a straight line, walk through anything her opponent threw at them or threw at her just because she was so much more physically imposing. This is something that we see in MMA. Some fighters are just too big and too physically imposing to hurt so that when you get a smaller fighter that doesn't have that physicality, they just can't really hurt them. Another really good example would be Jessica Andrade. Against the majority of her opponents in the strawweight division, she would just walk them down and they could literally drill her point blank in the face, clean and hard on the chin, and it wouldn't even snap her head back because of how much of an advantage she had in terms of physicality. Now, that is very, very notable to me because Jan Blakovic is a big, strong, physically imposing, natural 205 pound fighter, and Adesanya is coming up from middleweight. So, while from a technical point of view, I think there's a lot of things Adesanya does well that you can really cause Jakovic, uh, really cause Blakovic a problem with, the physicality could be the great equalizer here. Now, a couple of days ago, I was strongly considering a bet on Adesanya here because from my perspective, from a technical point of view, I think this is a very, very hard, difficult, stylistic matchup for Blakovic. I think Adesanya is too fast, too technical, too tricky and too good defensively for someone like Blakovic to cause him a problem. However, if physicality does favour Blakovic here, it is possible that even though Adesanya may be able to dance around on the outside and pick him off and use his speed against him. If Blakovic can walk through everything Adesanya throws at him because Adesanya doesn't have the same ability to hurt bigger opponents moving up from 185, that could make this a very difficult fight for Adesanya because they are fighting at the UFC Apex Center, which is a smaller cage. So... Adesanya's really got two different modes that he kind of alternates through. He's either got this mode where he stays on the outside, 
like he did against Joel Romero and just chips away at his opponent from a safe distance. He uses his high level striking in reverse to read when his opponent is going to come forward and attack and then when they come forward he just fucking gets on his bike and circles away from him. That strategy will be ultra ultra effective against Jan Blakovic because Blakovic is very flat footed, very slow, very stiff and very rigid. His hand speed for the most part is painfully slow and Adesanya should see his attacks coming from a mile away. Blakovic Izzy's vicious leg kicks and Izzy's great at switching stances and hammering the lead leg of his opponent from either stance so not only will Izzy beat up you know either the inside or the outside of the lead leg he can beat up the entire leg which is quite a unique skill which makes him kind of devastating if you just go and look at the 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 first round between you know, Adesanya and Barakinia. Skip to the end of that Barakinia fight. Uh, skip to the end of the first round of the Barakinia fight and look at the left leg of Barakinia. It was a fucking mess. And that was after just five minutes. And I'd actually say Blakovic is more susceptible to the leg kick than Barakinia. So that's a big path to victory for Izzy. But what I would say is Adesanya has these two modes that he floats between. The mode that we saw him use for the entire fight against Romero, where he just chips away at his opponent from a safe distance with jabs, long punches, leg kicks from a safe distance, and then when they blitz forward, he backs up his circles away from him. He also used this strategy in the first round against Barakinia to the point where Barakinia basically didn't land a punch in round one. But Izzy does this thing where he, he starts very slow, very similar to Pete Yan, and takes the first round and sometimes a little bit of the second round to figure you out. He throws a lot of feints at you to see how you react. He's downloading all the information. He's getting reads on you and trying to get his timing. Trying to get into a rhythm. Trying to find his range. And sometimes when he does this, instead of when you blitz forward and attack him, he circles away from you. He will start to stand his ground and instead of circling away from you to evade strikes, he'll look to use head movement to slip your strikes and counter you with big shots. So, the two modes, he, two, let recap, right? Two modes he alternates through. The mo mode usually early in his fights where when you come forward, he reads you're going to come forward. He's not interested in exchanging so he just backs up and circles away and you're left chasing shadows, punching air. He ain't there for you. The other mode is when you come forward, he has read you're about to come forward and attack him. So then he starts using head movement to slip your shots and fire him back with big counters. He used that strategy against, uh, if he used that strategy most obviously against Robert Whittaker, a little bit against Gastelum, and he did it in the second round against Costa. So for a really, really good, uh, a really, really good example of. Adesanya alternating between these two styles go look at the Paulo Costa fight because he used the first strategy in round one to figure Barakinia out and then once he'd figured him out he went in for the kill in round two now that could get him into trouble against Blakovic because Blakovic is one of these guys that is has just got a great chin he's tough as nails and he loves to exchange you know with him being a big, strong, natural 205 pounder. Adesanya doesn't want to be hit eating shots from this guy. You know, we've seen Adesanya drop by Gastelum. Blakovic is a hell of a lot bigger than Kelvin Gastelum. I think if Adesanya utilizes the same strategy that he used against Joel Romero, I think he dominates Jan and he wins this fight 50 45. Jan is completely and utterly ineffective in kickboxing range. Yan has also only got two modes that he alternates through. Yan will either stand in kickboxing range in the middle of the octagon throwing really heavy slow punches, which are very easy to read, particularly for a very, very high level striker like Adesanya. Or Yan will blitz forward in a straight line, just spamming straight punches. And when he did that is how he caught Dominic Reyes, it crushed his nose. Incidentally, that's also how he uh, how he, um, he 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 hurt the body of Reyes. That's how he landed the leg kicks. As he blitzed forward and Reyes tried to circle away, as Reyes circled away, he'd throw a leg kick and he kept catching him. 
But those are the only two modes that Blakovich has got. In the middle of the octagon, he's painfully, painfully, painfully ineffective and slow. We saw Thiago Santos hammer his lead leg and pick him apart. Blakovich couldn't get near Santos in this fight. If this fight takes place in kickboxing range, Izzy should just be able to chip away at him from a safe distance. The danger for Izzy comes when Blakovich blitzes forward with those straight punch attacks. But the danger doesn't come for Izzy because of what Blakovich does, because Izzy should be able to read those blitzing attacks coming from a mile away because Blakovich is quite slow. The danger comes from how Israel chooses to deal with those blitzing attacks. Does he utilize the same strategy that he used against Joel Romero and not get sucked into those crazy exchanges and just circle away and have Blakovich mostly punch in air? Or does he utilize the same strategy we saw against Robert Whittaker where once he feels like he's got a read on Blakovich, he starts to plant his feet, try to slip those blitzed attacks with head movement and fire back with big counters. If he starts to do that, he could definitely get caught by, by Blakovich and there's danger there for Izzy. Unfortunately, because we're not in Izzy's camp, we don't know what strategy he's going to employ here. Now, a lot of people are saying Yan by KO, you know, Blakovich can win by KO. I personally feel it's quite unlikely Blakovich knocks Adesanya out because I don't personally feel Blakovich is that dangerous. Blakovich is very ineffective in kickboxing range and very, very slow. Hand speed is painfully slow. Izzy's going to have a massive speed advantage here. And he's going to see Blakovich coming from a mile away. Izzy is only in trouble standing here if, like I say, he tries to stand his ground and fight Blakovich in a phone booth. Which Izzy has been known to do at times when he feels like he's got a read on his opponent. But the question is, is Blakovich going to be the first guy to be able to finish Adesanya in MMA? I know Adesanya has been knocked out in kickboxing. But will Blakovich be the first guy to knock Adesanya out in MMA? I personally feel it's unlikely. Adesanya's movement, his speed, his striking defense is brilliant. He sees everything coming. It's like he's in the matrix. And Yan is very slow. I can't emphasize enough how slow Yan is, how big the speed gap is between these two. And I also don't feel that Blakovich is a particularly dangerous striker. If we look at his record, around 35 pro MMA fights... And if we go all the way back through his career, we can see that he's only won. There's one, two, three, four. That's probably due to strikes, so that would be five, six. So only six fights. So we can see that in Jan Blakovic's 35 fight career, he's only stopped six of his opponents with strikes. With Blakovic being a striker, I think that's a pretty crappy out return, to be honest with you. You know, Blakovic has been a striker for his entire career and to only finish six of his 35 career opponents with strikes doesn't shout to me that this guy is particularly dangerous. On top of that, if we look at some of his recent wins due to strikes, it was against Corey Anderson, who we know is very chinny, Luke Rockhold, who we know is made of glass, and, you know, Ilya Latifi, who's hardly a bastion of durability. So, you know, if we look at that, half of the number of wins Blakovich has due to strikes against Anderson, Rockhold and Latifi are against guys who aren't exactly that durable, which makes it that even less impressive for Blakovich. So while, you know, he's looked great in his last few fights against Reyes and Anderson, and, you know, he's a big, strong physically imposing tough guy I just think his power is a little bit overstated I'm not saying he doesn't have any power I'm not saying he can't knock Adesanya out but remember what I always say we want to bet on the most likely outcomes we want to put our money in strong positions and based on all the information we've got available it doesn't look like Yan's that dangerous right all we can do is try and make the best decision possible with the information we've got available. And the information we've got available is telling us Blakovich maybe isn't as powerful or as dangerous as people think he is. But I'll leave that up to you to decide. The final thing that I want to talk about in this breakdown is the, the X Factor that we've touched on a little bit in this video 
but I haven't fully explored. And that is the physicality differential. So to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, let's hear what Izzy says here, where he's talking about how much he may weigh coming into this fight. Just listen to this. Could I ask how much do you weigh right now? Well, I range from 89.25 kgs to 93.5 kgs. That's like the fluctuation. But right now, if you want to ask, because I got off the plane last night. When did we, last night? Yeah, la yesterday evening. I haven't really ate since then. I've kind of just chilled. Um, yeah, maybe 91 or 90 kgs. Yeah. Okay, so now we have a problem. I have no idea what that means in... Uh... Oh, you <laughs> Americans, get with the program. Get with the world's program. Pound sterlings and pie per square inch of whatever. I don't know. I'm going to break the fourth wall here and just pull out my uh, my Google machine. Do it. This Do is it, important. Deadpool. You said 91 kg? That's in 90 kgs right now. I'm going to say 90 kgs. Okay, 90 kg is uh, 198.4 pounds. Yeah, sure. How much do you expect to weigh on Friday morning? <laughs> uh, I'm tell you what, I'm going to keep the same energy during my fight week. I'm not going to go crazy and order Uber Eats and cakes and whatever. I'm just going to keep the same energy. Going to use my guy, Jordy Nutrition. Going to use Jordy to um, fuel me this whole week. Um, Kai is hopping in the... Uh, and the sauna on the bath. So I'm going to do the same thing like I always do. Um, mainly just for my routine, my mind. It's not a superstition thing. It's just my body just knows what it does. Like or, my body knows it's fight week already. So it's going to start dropping weight just because this is what my body does. My body just realizes like, oh, yeah, it's what we're doing. So I'm just going to keep the same energy. I'm not going to change anything different and then start to like get all crazy. And yeah, don't be surprised if I weigh in at like 190. Three. Yeah, don't be surprised. 193 for a 205 fight. Don't be surprised. Okay. So just curious. You know, Paul went at like 230 something or whatever it was. Okay, so that is a huge red flag, what Adesanya just said there. Because if he is serious about weighing in at 193 pounds, that completely changes everything that i've said because physicality remember what we were saying earlier on in the breakdown where we were using examples of connor against nate or you know jessica andrage as being these fighters that could just walk through whatever their opponent throws at them right in the last breakdown with nunez and anderson we were saying maybe nunez is too small to hurt anderson and trouble her in ways we've seen her trouble her past opponents we could see the same phenomenon happen here where maybe if adesanya really does come in that light He's just not going to be able to hurt a big, strong, physically imposing guy like Blakovich like he can hurt guys in the middleweight division. And maybe Blakovich can walk through everything that Adesanya throws at him and cause him big trouble. Also, we touched on the fact that this is going to be in a small cage. If Adesanya wants to kind of stay on... Say, for example, Blakovich is coming forward, right? With lots of forward pressure... And his physicality is too much for Adesanya to handle. Adesanya can't back him up. Well, then the main path to victory for Adesanya comes from staying light on his feet, staying on the outside, playing the role of Matador, and chipping away at Blakovich with counter-striking from the outside. That is a lot harder to do in the apex centre because the cage is a lot smaller. Adesanya is just going to have a lot less room to move around than he would in the cage they'd use for a big pay-per-view. So the, 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 the threat of Adesanya weighing in light completely changes this fight. So where I'm at at the moment is I'm just going to wait and see what happens on weigh-in day to figure out whether I'm going to bet this fight or not. If Adesanya comes in at around 205, I'm probably going to bet him because I think if he comes in at about 205, he's probably going to have the size and physicality to at least somewhat deal with Blakovich's, you know, physically imposing style of fighting, right? Might not be able to match it, but if he weighs in at 205, he's probably going to be able to deal with it. If Adesanya weighs in at like 193, 195, this is a hard pass from me. 
hard pass because then I'll be very, very worried about Adesanya lacking the power to hurt Blakovic. This is a big deal. You know, we've seen many, many times in the past guys move up a weight class and they just can't hurt their opponent in the same way they can hurt guys in the lighter weight class. Another really good example of this was Max Holloway when he moved up against Dustin Poirier. You know, there would be moments in that Poirier fight where Holloway would just tee off on Poirier and he just couldn't hurt him. Now, there wasn't a massive size difference between those two in terms of the wingspan. In actual th fact, I think Holloway might have been a bit taller than Poirier. But because of the difference in physicality, you know, Holloway just couldn't hurt Poirier in the same way that he could hurt guys at 145 like Calvin Cater. So that's really, really notable, and we've got to keep an eye on this. Adesanya may not carry the same pop in his shots at 205, especially if he's weighing in, late, uh, weighing in very light. Now, if you're asking me what I think he's going to weigh in at, personally, I'd be surprised if he weighed in at, uh, at light at like 193, 195, only because if you go back and look at some of Adesanya's earlier weigh-ins for his last few fights, you know, maybe we can find some here, right? What was this? UFC 253. Let's see if we can find the video. Let's see if we can find the, uh, the weigh-in video. We want the actual weigh-in. This is the one we need. If we look at, we skim through and look for Izzy, you could say that for his last few fights, he has not looked good on the scale. He's looked very sucked in, very skinny, and very dehydrated, which makes me believe this is a very tough cut to 185 for him. So I would be very, very surprised if after having a tough cut to, tough cut to 185, he then, you know, only weighs in at, uh, at you know, 193, 194, 195 for this light heavyweight fight. Where is Izzy? Where is he? Where is he? Where's Izzy? Where is Izzy? Have I missed him? Where's Izzy, guys? Oh, here he is. Sorry, 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 sorry. I missed him. But if you look at Izzy on the scales here, you know, he looked very skinny, face a little bit sucked in. Doesn't like this. look like this was the easiest weight cut for him. And so, you know... I'd be surprised. He's a big guy. He's a big guy. You know, he's six foot four. If he really does weigh in at 193, you know, 194, 195, that would be a bit of a red flag for me. But I think he's going to come in heavier. So in terms of betting this fight, it's a wait and see moment for me. I'm going to wait and see how Izzy looks on the scales. You know, how these guys look at the face off and the actual number that Adesanya weighs in at. If he weighs in, you know, 193, 194, 195, I'll pass. If he weighs in 205, I'll probably bet Izzy. There you go. Hope you found that useful. That is going to be it for this breakdown video. I think I covered everything. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button below. Don't forget, if this video gets 300 likes, I will do a prop bet live stream on Saturday. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I would love to get to 5,000 subscribers by the end of this month. And on top of that, don't forget to check out my website, MMABettingTips.com. Right now, we have spaces in our live betting group. If you want to make a lot of money betting on MMA, I strongly recommend you check that out. You could be very, very happy with uh, with the results. Uh, I think, like, look, I, I don't like to do the whole sales thing, but fucking go check out live betting because we crush like every week. It's disgusting, and these spaces won't be around for much longer. We have to have a membership cap. Because the more people that live bet the same thing at the same time, the faster the odds decline. So get in while you still can. With that, thank you for watching everyone. Love you very much. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think of these breakdowns. Like, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Have a great week guys. Hope you crush it on Saturday.